Welcome to Love for the Truth podcast. I'm Cindy Hartline, host of Love for the Truth radio and founder and teacher of the Prophesied Bride of Christ teaching series. Well, today my message is on the parable of the ten virgins. The parable of the ten virgins. And what the parable of the ten virgins has to do with the Bride of Christ and the ancient Jewish wedding. Let us take a moment to pray. Lord, for all those who are listening to this podcast, I pray that you would give them spiritual ears to hear and eyes to see the in-depth spiritual meaning of the parable of the ten virgins. And Lord, may the words I speak be pleasing to you and that your will will be done. In the name above all names, Jesus Christ, our King and Almighty God. Amen. A few years ago, the Lord spoke to me during one of my devotional times and said three words, prepare, prepare, prepare. Little did I know what we would have to prepare for. So much has changed in the last few years. But I believe ultimately the Lord wants us to prepare for His return. And that's what I'm going to be speaking about today. But I'd like to take a moment to look at Matthew 24. It was when Jesus was talking to His disciples, when they were showing Him the temple and, and how beautiful it was and all that would perhaps glorify Him. And Jesus said unto them, See you not that all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And he sat upon the Mount of Olives, and the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, Lord, when shall these things be? When shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus went on to tell them what the spirit of the age would be like. He said, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am the Christ. In other words, I am the anointed one. And shall deceive many. And you shall hear wars and rumors of wars. And see that you not be troubled, for these things must come to pass. But then the end is still not yet. And he goes on to say, For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes and diverse places. And he said, But these are the beginning of sorrows. And then he goes on to say, they shall deliver you up, and you'll be afflicted, and shall kill you. But he goes on in the Olive Discourse to say four times that one of the signs is to take heed that no man deceive you. And he goes on to say, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then the end shall come. What Jesus was saying to them was that in these last days, the spirit of the age will arise and deceive many. And that's exactly where we are today, especially when we see the redefinition of marriage, of sanctity of life, transgenderism, sexual orientation. All of these things defy the holiness of God Almighty. It is evident that we are in a spiritual warfare. The difference between God's kingdom and Satan's kingdom. And we know that the spirit of the age has entered into the church, and we see that the glory of God or the light of the church has been diminished. We see a lot of churches uh, falling apart and, and, and not even existing anymore. We also see churches that have had uh, deception come into the doors, through the doors. Let me read some statistics for you. 30% of evangelicals agree that Jesus was a great teacher, but he wasn't God. 28% of evangelical church attenders are not born again. And only 48% of Americans believe that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. And only 66% believe that Jesus rose from the dead. Is it any wonder why we're seeing the redefinition of marriage, sanctity of life, transgenderism, and sexual orientation. Somewhere along the line, we've 
We've lost the spirit of the living God in our churches or among us. And that's why I want to talk to you today about the Ten Virgins, how important it is to have the spirit of the living God residing and living inside of us. I want to go to, uh, before I get started on the parable, I'd like to go back to uh, Mary of Bethany just very quickly, you know, and, and there's a reason why I'm going to do that. Now when Jesus was in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, there came unto him a woman having an alabaster box of great precious ointment and poured it on top of his head as he sat at me. But when his disciples saw it, they had an indignation, saying to him, What purpose is this waste? For this ointment might have been sold for much and given to the poor. But then Jesus said, Why trouble you? For she has wrought a good work upon me. For in that she had done, poured this ointment on my body, she did it for my burial. What Jesus was saying here is that what this woman had done for him, he delighted in, and that he would not always be with the disciples. But he goes on to say, Verily I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached, so shall this story be told in remembrance of her. You see, in those days, um, parents sometimes would leave to their children an inheritance. And the alabaster box that was given to her was most likely given to her by her parents. And the oil or the ointment that was inside of this alabaster box uh, oftentimes uh, was extremely expensive. If you can take uh, today's wages that one makes in one year, one or two years, that was how much the ointment would be in these alabaster boxes. And so what Mary had done is she took all of her inheritance, everything that she had, and she just poured it all over him. And Jesus delighted in that. And I guess the question is, is do we take all that we have, all that God has given to us, do we take that and pour it out on Him? You know, in today's gospel, we hear a lot of what, what Jesus is going to do for us. He's our Savior. He's going to save us from hell. He's going to give us this, and we're asking for that. And, you know, we, we, we go to Him as our Savior. But do we ever go to Him as a king? You know, someone that we need to bow down to and give reverence to and, and give all that we have and delight in who He is and how He and what all that He's given us or what we're becoming in Him. And that's what I want to look at. I want you to just think on that for a minute before I get into the parable of the Ten Virgins about this anointing or that Mary had done on Jesus and the ointment that she had and the ex how expensive it was in that little alabaster box. Just take a moment and think on that. And then we're going to start right now on the, uh, on the parable of the ten virgins. And you're going to see how relevant uh, that story of Mary of Bethany is in reference to this parable. So I want you to just med meditate on that for a little bit. You know, from the beginning of time, we see that God the Father desired a marital-type covenant relationship with His people. In Genesis, He said it was not good for man to be alone. So from Adam's rib, He created Eve, a bride for Adam. God the Father made a marital-type covenant with Noah, Abraham, Israel through the Mosaic Law, David, and our new covenant inaugurated by Jesus. He obviously desires a covenant people who would be faithful and true to Him, just like Mary of Bethany was, those whom He could trust. You know, the Father has been and is presently arranging a wedding for His Son. He is preparing a soon-to-be grandeur wedding feast, one that is beyond what we could ever, ever imagine. The feast is called the Marriage Supper of the Lamb. Invitations have been sent to whosoever would believe in, honor, and love God and His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. Many were, and still are, preoccupied with their own lives and not interested in responding to the Father's invitation nor attending to the wedding feast. 
Sadly, they did not know that the consummation of their marriage and wedding feast is their ultimate call, the reason for salvation, the goal of their redemptive journey and their eternal destiny. Those who do respond to the invitation are expected to be dressed properly in honor of the Father's Son, who is worthy to be praised and glorified. The wedding garment typifies the righteousness of the saints who were freely given the garment, but must take care of it and keep it on. Sadly, many are called, but only few will be chosen. You know, to me, there's nothing more beautiful than a wedding. I cry every time when I see one. I often think that it won't be long before when we no longer witness such a tradition of holy matrimony the way that God ordained it, as I said before. My utmost favorite part of the ceremony is when the beautiful bride, all dressed in white, appears at the door or the gate and walks slowly down the narrow aisle to meet her beloved groom at the altar. Her eyes are fixed on him, and his eyes are fixed on her. Liken to us fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, as we journey down our narrow way to our high calling in Christ Jesus. All the attendees' eyes are watching the bride's every move. And with an intimate and intense focus on his bride, I love how the groom's countenance delights in how beautiful she looks. She has prepared herself and has made herself ready for him. I often think about what it would be like when I walk down the aisle, heaven's golden aisle, and up the stairs to my groom, King of kings and Lord of lords, who is high and lifted up and seated on the throne, will I be ready? Will you be ready? I want Jesus, my groom, to delight in me, just like he delighted in Mary of Bethany. Now imagine, ladies, if it was your wedding, and at the last minute you got a spot right on the front of your dress, and though you tried to get it off, it looked more smeared and bigger than ever before walking down that aisle. And imagine, men, if your suit jacket was ridiculously wrinkled just before you went to the altar. Now imagine your groom being the king. How would either of you feel? Embarrassed? Ashamed? unworthy, distraught. You know, Jesus desires a bride without spot or wrinkle. And if we love him and we want him to delight in us, then we will do everything that we can to, to abide in him. Um, I want to get started now on the, the parable itself of the ten virgins. You know, this, this short but profound parable has many interpretations. And through the eyes of a Jewish Midrash perspective is, is what we're going to look at this parable. I want to quickly read to you what that means. According to the Jewish encyclopedia, the term Midrash designates an exegesis, which going more deeply than the mere literal sense, attempts to penetrate the spirit of the scriptures to examine the text from all sides and thereby derive interpretations which are not immediately obvious. Now, Midrash is vast and complex, containing multiple approaches. In simple terms, a Midrash perspective reveals an in-depth spiritual meaning in multiple types and shadows. You know, when we look at this, there's so many different interpretations. And I believe, according to the Midrash perspective, that all of them can be true and reveal truth to the listeners. You know, the ten virgins is a parable, and Jesus told his disciples that he spoke in parables because those who had ears to hear would hear and know the right interpretation. Those who have ears to hear have the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit dwelling in them who bears witness of the truth. And Jesus also said that there would be those who do not have ears to hear and who would not understand. They are those who do not have the Holy Spirit to bear witness of Christ's Word, Spirit, and the Spirit of Truth. And how many agree that we need the Holy Spirit to enlighten us, to give us spiritual knowledge or insight about all subjects and situations? 
The point is, is we need to be born again of the Spirit. Many of you, I'm sure, have heard a sermon on this parable before. But did you know that this parable of the ten virgins is one of the most controversial ones? Oh God, Lord, help me on this. But I believe that what the Lord has showed me, I want to share with you. And I, I, I would like you to go to the Lord and ask Him for confirmation. You know, these are, are just a few of the many questions are generally asked concerning the parable. You know, some say, are the foolish virgins a type of Israel and the wise virgins a type of, type of Gentiles? I believe it could very well be. Are the foolish virgins a type of carnal Christians and the wise virgins a type of spiritual Christians with both being saved? I do not believe that this parable is saying that. Or do the foolish virgins typify the lost and the wise virgins, the saved? I do not believe in that either. I believe this parable is referring to those who profess to be Christians. The question is, is their profession by mouth only or by the way that they live? And I want to I reiterate that. And I want you to think on that. Is their profession by mouth only or by the way that they live? In other words... Do these virgins have head knowledge of the Word or love Jesus, the living Word, from John 1? You know, many universities used to be seminaries, Yale, Princeton, Harvard, etc. And though they have turned away from God's Word and have turned towards education, they for the most part have kept some of the lingo on the word profession. Uh, they'll say, decide what profession you want. Um, take the courses or the track that will help you lead to your goal, to your profession. And when you graduate with having accurate, accurate head knowledge, you begin to practice what you have learned and become a practitioner of your field. Well, we need to practice what we profess. Amen? There are more Midrash types I'd like to bring to your attention in reference to the parable of the Ten Virgins, but... Uh, I believe the parable of the ten virgins signifies the betrothal phase of the ancient Jewish wedding. Before reading the parable, however, I'd like to give you a quick overview, overview of the basic rituals of the ancient Jewish wedding custom, which parallels our salvation and redemptive journey. Just real quickly... I'm sure many of you have heard this before, but for those who have not, I'd like to uh, reiterate that first, a marriage is arranged by the groom's father, according to the ancient Jewish wedding. The young man proposes to his prospective bride with a bride price, a written covenant, which is a legal contract, a goblet of wine. And though the marriage was arranged, the prospective bride had the choice to accept or reject the proposal. If she drank from the cup, it was a sign that she accepted the young man's proposal. The couple at that point were considered legally betrothed, which was the same as being legally married. This began the legal betrothal phase of the marriage. However, there was no physical relationship. The bridegroom would go back to the father's house to build an attached room for his beloved bride for them to live in. And while his bride stayed at her father's house to prepare and to get ready for her wedding, the groom would return to redeem his bride when his father said that his work was perfectly finished, which could take a year or two. You can see how the ancient Jewish wedding in a Midrash type represents how God the Father arranged a marriage for his son with whosoever believes in him. How Jesus paid the bride price with his sacrificial blood. And how his written word is our covenant, his vow to us. How when we take communion, we are confirming and reminding ourselves that we accepted his proposal and vow to be faithful to him till the end, just as that bride took a sip of that wine. Jesus is currently in the Father's house now preparing a place for us, for those who are indeed his bride. Jesus goes on to say in the scriptures that in my father's house, there were many mansions. 
I go to prepare a place for you. If it was not so, I would have told you. Okay, so now with all of that in mind, basically how uh, the spirit of the age is rearing its ugly head, how Jesus warned us of the deception to be careful that we wouldn't fall prey to it, how Mary of Bethany poured out all that she had, all the oil, the ointment that she had over Jesus, and how he delighted in that. How the Spirit of God, in some cases, have left the church, in some churches. And how the glory of God is, is not found, and, and how we, the church, considered being the church, have lost our light to change things, to overcome the spirit of this age. So think on those things. And I'm going to, if, if you're following in your Bible, turn with me to Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 through 13. I will read the parable of the ten virgins. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. And while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all the virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us your oil, for our lamps have gone out. But the wise answered and said, No, 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 not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourself. And while they went out to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage. And the door was shut. And afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for you know not neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man hath come. I'm talking about when Jesus returns. Notice that this parable begins with the kingdom of heaven. You know, this phrase is, in Greek is basilia, meaning of royal nature, royal power, kingship, dominion and rule. And I, I want you to think of this wedding. You know, when Jesus returns, he's going to return as a king. Even though he's returning to redeem his bride, he's returning as a king. Apparently, this wedding is not an ordinary one, as the processional was expected to be a royal fanfare. An elaborate parade of horsemen, musicians, guards, loyal family members, and villagers, led by two trumpet musicians who would announce the arrival of the guest of honor, which was usually a king. A wedding that would live up to the bridegroom's expectation, which was accomplished under his instructions and his kingdom rule. Now, I know that when we look back to the ancient Jewish wedding, that all weddings were not like this. They were not uh, a king, but I, I want us to, to look at that and see and visualize a grandeur type of processional similar to that of Prince Charles and Princess Diana's wedding. Now imagine being called to such a glorious processional and not being ready, especially at the last minute. It would be most devastating. How many here have gone to a wedding and wanted to make sure that everything was just right and in order? How many believe that they are in a betrothal covenant relationship with Jesus Christ as their groom and king? It takes on a whole different level and thought process, doesn't it? You know, we need to practice the reverence, the obedience, the faithfulness, and the life of worship that our king deserves from us to be ready. Like Mary of Bethany, she knew who he was and what he deserved. We read that at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. You know, traditionally the king's servants would run ahead and warn the bride and the virgins 
of his nearness, his best man would blow the shofar about a mile or so away from the bride's house and yell, Behold, the bridegroom is near! Now, I'm, I'm not sure that this is going to take place, but I'll tell you one thing, that when we look at this uh, grandeur kind of processional, I want you to think of when Jesus returns, okay, there's going to be angels. There's going to be a trumpet heard. In type, we are witnessing and hearing continuous warnings, aren't we? God's servants and messengers are telling us that Jesus' return, Jesus's return is imminent, that their cries are heard in this darkness by those who have ears to hear. You know, we've been hearing how many years now? For seven years, I talked on Love for the Truth Radio about the warnings, about where we're headed, about what was happening with false doctrines and the deception that was coming into the church and the technology that was on the rise. And guess what? We're seeing that now openly. Notice that the ancient Jewish wedding began at midnight, the midnight hour, when the bridegroom would come to take his betrothed bride from her father's house to bring her to his father's house by the way of a processional, a ceremonial type parade. Now, we are living in dark times where holy matrimony is not honored, like I mentioned before, where unrighteousness and immorality is abounding because of deception and almost honored. How many would agree that it's almost midnight right now where truth is accounted as evil? Evil. Or I'm sorry, good is accounted as evil and evil is accounted as good. And truth is is accounted as deception, and deception is accounted as truth. You know, how many believe that the rapture will be soon? Okay, let's go further into this parable and how it relates to, in a Midrash perspective, how it relates to the ancient Jewish wedding. You know, the fact that there were 10 virgins gives us another Midrash clue of what was expected of them. Now, according to the ancient Jewish law, a legal body of counsel consisted of 10 persons. For example, 10 counselors or witnesses were required for the authorities at the city gate to seal all contracts, including a betrothal covenant. In type, these are the church leaders, the shepherds who watch over the flock, who lead and guide believers, as well as hold them accountable. It was customary and end in tandem with the Jewish law for the betrothed Jewish bride to select ten virgins, here it is, to be her personal counselors and handmaidens to help her prepare for her wedding and marriage. In type, the virgins represent our closest Christian companions who counsel, encourage us in time of need as we do the same for them. The fact that they were all, quote, virgins, also speaks of the ancient Jewish wedding custom. Interestingly enough, they were all, quote, virgins. They were not adulteresses in a sense of believing in other gods. Now, in type, they represent all professing believers, the church body, those who believe in the same God, the Father, and in Jesus Christ, His Son, those that serve one another on behalf of Jesus Christ, those who gather in church or, or in a ministry, they are those who call themselves, quote, Christians. They all appear to be dressed the same and having a form of righteousness. Traditionally, it was made clear that choosing virgins, in particular for handmaidens, was wise and likened to selecting God-fearing young women who would seemingly have godly attributes in character, integrity, and work ethic. We have to choose our Christian friends wisely. You know, it was also important that the betrothed bride choose virgins that she could trust to help her prepare for the wedding for one to possibly two years till her betrothed bride returned for her. Much dependent on the handmaiden's faithfulness, loyalty, and dedication to their own calling as they were also in covenant with the bride and the bridegroom as their witnesses. 
The ten virgins were to share their talents, abilities, skills, and gifts to help the young bride get ready. They would also act as her guardians during her betrothal phase to keep the young bride accountable to her vow and to all that would please her bridegroom, which was written in their betrothal covenant contract. Now, this typifies how we share our talents, abilities, skills, and spiritual gifts to help edify and sanctify the church at large, the body of Christ. It was also the virgin's handmaiden's duty, per the groom's request, to have oil-filled lamps in hand to light a path for the wedding processional for him and his bride when he returned, which began at the bride's house and ended at the groom's father's house where the consummation of the marriage and the wedding feast would take place. You know, we are all called to be lights in this dark world, to light our way as well as the path for others, not only by what we do and how we serve, but how we act as Christ-like examples. No, we're, we're not perfect or totally mature yet, but we can express remorse when we do sin by humbling ourselves and repenting of poor actions or attitudes to get that right again. It's like taking a shower and getting cleaned up. It's our responsibility to keep those relationships right. It was also imperative that the young bride practice her own God-given talents, abilities, skills, and spiritual gifts as an example to her handmaidens. You know, we need time alone with our Maker to learn how to hone those gifts ones that He has entrusted to us. And how we use our talents speaks of how we honor Him, the one who gave the talents to us. We don't hide or bury them. We use them for His glory. Though all virgins were in covenant agreement, there was no guarantee that all ten virgins would serve the bride till the end. The attesting of their faithfulness weighed heavily on their loyalty and endurance and how well each handmaiden was ready with a filled and trimmed oil lamp in hand to light the path for the entire wedding processional from the bride's house to the bridegroom's father's house. Attesting means to provide or serve a clear evidence of, to be a witness to, or or to certify formally. In In other words, it was an attesting of some of the bridesmaids, or I'm sorry, matrons or maidens, it was an attesting to see if they would be loyal to the end, if they would be uh, faithful to endure to that moment when they were to light the path for the entire wedding processional. And we, I want to talk about the groom's arrival. Customarily, the bridegroom, after a year or two of preparation without seeing his bride, would arrive at the bride's father's house on an unexpected day around the midnight hour to take his betrothed bride home. It was the virgin's ultimate responsibility to be ready with lamps in hand, as I said before. In type, the groom's arrival speaks, I believe, of the rapture of the church. Matthew 25, 13 says, Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. And 1 Thessalonians 4, 16-17 says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven, from the Father's house, with a shout, and with the voice of an archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. There were five wise virgins who had extra oil for their lamps and five foolish virgins who had no oil left. You know, the lamps represent our profession of faith represents the profession that we have according to the Word of God. Interestingly, all ten virgins had lamps. They are those who profess to have faith in Jesus Christ. In other words, they are those who say they believe in Jesus and follow Him according to His Word, according to the Bible. 
Psalm 119, 104 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. We have to ask ourselves this question. Am I holding forth the word of God pertaining to all matters of life? Allowing Jesus, who is the word, to be my guide? Or am I guiding my own life, using his word for my convenience? Boy, that's a good one. Let's say that again. Am I allowing Jesus, who is the word, to be my guide? Or am I guiding my own life using his word, the Bible, for my convenience? Well, Hebrews 10.23 says, Let us hold fast to the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promise. You know, his covenant, his word to us according to the Bible is his covenant to us. And he is faithful. All that he promised in his word. He is faithful to. 2 Samuel 22, 29 says, For thou art my lamp, O Lord, and the Lord will lighten my darkness. We need that, that lamp now, don't we? we? We need those who say they believe in Jesus Christ to be a lamp, to, to be a profession to others, to keep that lamp lit, to be a light to the world. That's what we're calling to be. The oil represents the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ and His presence. Now notice, all the virgins had oil in their lamps. Even the foolish ones had oil at one time because they said their lamps had gone out. Do you see where I'm going here? These were all professing Christians today. That's what they represent. Having oil in one's vessel speaks of those who have or had an encounter with or an indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The wise virgins in type are those who continue to engage with the leading and guiding of the Holy Spirit, perhaps by reading the Word, having devotions, prayer, engaging with the Holy Spirit by saying, Holy Spirit, lead me, convict me, Show me the truth. The Holy Spirit bears witness of God's Word, the Spirit of truth, and the very Spirit of Jesus Christ. To engage in a relationship with Jesus Christ is to become one with Him in spirit. One with Him in spirit. One needs the help of the Holy Spirit who gives us the unction and the conviction and the power to change to be one in spirit with Jesus, our grow, making us ready. And that's what I want you to think about now, is that we're talking about the spirit of the living God living and abiding in us. Romans 8, 14 says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. You know, many in the church today are led by the knowledge of, of the word. They have a lot of knowledge of the word, but may not practice that word in their daily lives. The foolish virgins speak of those who have apparently neglected and quenched the leading and guiding of the Holy Spirit. Though all might appear well on the outside, they apparently have lost their way. They can't see without light, without illumination of the word, without the Holy Spirit. They may ha- have head knowledge of the Word. They may love having the knowledge of the Word, but they don't love Jesus, who is the living Word. Did you get that? Some may have love for the knowledge of the Word, but they don't love Jesus, who is the living Word. 1 Corinthians 2.14 reads, But the natural man received not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. You know, we think of uh, King David, you know, when we read how, uh, of course, today we're given the gift of the Holy Spirit, but we're not to quench the Holy Spirit. Psalm 51, 11 speaks about how David said, cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Can we quench the Holy Spirit to the point of of not hearing the leading and guiding of the Holy Spirit? Absolutely. 
But how can we be saved or how can we walk out our salvation without the leading and guiding of the Holy Spirit, without the Word of God? Ephesians 4.30 says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed until the day of redemption. Now that word seal, a lot of people get really caught on that word sealed. But that seal, okay, if you look it up, go, go to a Blue Letter Bible or go to any of your concordances, Seal, that seal there is sphragizo, S-P-H-R-A-G-I-Z-O. It means to confirm or to attest. And that what that means is to prove one's testimony to a person that he is what he professes to be. In other words, we'll know that someone has the spirit of the living God when their life has changed. You know, I'm going to bring this to your attention. I, I just have to... I don't want to go on a rabbit trail here, but you know, I came to the Lord in 78, 1978. And back then, you know, we would say when we meet a Christian, hey, are you a Christian? Yeah. We'd say, are you born again? And they say, yeah, I am. Let me share my testimony. You know, when somebody says, yes, I'm born again, we'd say, yeah, please share your testimony. How did it happen? Where did the change take place? I want to hear it. It encourages me. And then through the years in the 80s and 90s, you know, we heard, are you a Christian? Yeah. What church do you go to? Do you know there's over 2,000 denominations in the United States and over 5,000 Christian denominations globally? We were concerned about the denomination. What church do you go to? I don't know if I believe in the assembly gods. I don't know if I believe in the Baptist. Why? Because men's philosophy came and mixed in with the true word of God and took people on specific courses. But we know that if someone is filled with the Holy Spirit, there will be a change of life. They will have a testimony to what they profess to be. Again, that sealed word there, that we're sealed to the day of redemption, what that's saying is that the Lord had given us the Holy Spirit, but how we operate or engage with that Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit is our choice. And if we choose to listen, to have ears to hear, to the leading and guiding of the Holy Spirit without quenching the Holy Spirit will lead us into all truth and understanding and the spirit of truth, which testifies of the spirit of Christ, of who He is, we will have an understanding of that. And that is what I'm referring to as the oil. The oil of the Lord, the oil that we're seeing, okay, in this, um, in this lamp, the oil that I'm referring to is as we gauge, engage with the Holy Spirit, it produces more oil. And as it produces more oil in us, more understanding, more testimony, more clarification, more understanding how God is working in and through our lives. That's what we give to others. That's what we give back to Jesus. That's where we pour out our oil upon Him to say, thank you for the gifts that you've given us. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. Thank you for the Spirit of Truth. Thank you for being an example the Spirit of Christ to us, Lord. And when we see that in others, we are encouraged because we can see not only the change in them, but we can be encouraged by their continual testimonies, testifying of how the Lord Jesus Christ and how the Holy Spirit is working in and through their lives. That's what the oil is in our lamps. Can you imagine now these, these foolish virgins all right, asking for somebody else's oil? You imagine that they're, they're like they're saying, you know, give me the Holy Spirit that you have in you and all of your experiences and all of your testimony. Give us some of your oil. 
Can you, can you see now where that's impossible? There's going to be Christians that have head knowledge and those who have the spirit of the living God living in them. And ones with head knowledge has to go and buy for themselves. You know, the wick typifies how one abides in Christ, and that, that's what we need to do. Our souls that need trimming and pruning from time to time, uh, we need to keep our hearts aflame, burning brightly for our groom by, by asking the Lord, according to His Word, to, to trim us. Trimming of the wick speaks of the pruning of one's soul to bear more spiritual fruit, more uprightness, more righteousness, continually changing to be more like Christ, repenting of sin and asking for help on a daily basis. John 15, 1 through 6 says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it, that it may bring more fruit. Know you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you, but abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of it itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can you, except you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and it is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Okay, so there's uh, our responsibility is to abide in Christ. The flame, that brightly lit flame, resembles the Spirit of Christ living in us and the Spirit of Truth who leads us, making us an example and vessels of light in this dark world. This speaks of those who are indeed a light to this world. They are examples of Christ. They have His anointing when using certain gifts and placed in particular positions. 1 John 1, 7 says, But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. Romans 8, 9 says, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Romans 8, 14 says, For as many as are led of the Spirit of God, I read this before, they are the sons of God. The foolish virgins wanted the anointing, but they have to buy it for themselves. You can share a Bible, but you cannot share the Holy Spirit residing inside of you. So we see here that the, the wise virgins are those who have the Holy Spirit in them. They have God's anointing. They glorify God by being a light to this world, and the foolish virgins are those who do not have that light abiding in them. Apparently, they do not have the Spirit of the living God abiding in them. Now, in the, according to the ancient Jewish wedding, you know, once the door to the wedding was shut, no one was allowed in. And we see that though the foolish virgins at the last minute seemingly they bought oil, I guess. It doesn't say that they did. But they knocked on the door, even calling him Lord, saying, Lord, 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 let us in. They called him Lord. And he answers, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. I know you not. So let's look at this interpretation. Were some just carnal Christians, but they're saved? I'm going to leave that question for you. When Jesus says, I know you not, he was saying, I am not in spiritual one accord with you. Because they did not have the Holy Spirit who witnesses his spirit and the spirit of truth living inside of them. 1 John 3, 2 says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doeth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We shall be like him. We cannot be like him unless we have the Holy Spirit and the Spirit of truth residing in us. Watch therefore, for ye know not neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Okay, now I want to talk about the bride. We talked about the ten virgins. According to the ancient Jewish wedding custom, it was understood that the duty of the virgins was to serve the bride. 
but there is no mention of a bride in this parable. Where or who then is the bride? Okay, this is my interpretation. You can take this to the Lord, but I believe the bride remains anonymous in this parable for a very good reason. Once again, in type, according to the ancient Jewish wedding custom, the bride remained veiled right up until the consummation of the marriage when her virgin status was truly confirmed. Many who were invited to the wedding, even those who were part of the processional, did not know who the bride was because she was still veiled. The veil was not taken off until after the consummation, like I said, and she was revealed to those who attended the wedding at the wedding feast. Side note, this is why Jacob didn't know it was Leah and not Rachel that he had married. Her veil was not taken off until after the consummation of the marriage. Only the Father and Jesus knows who his bride is. Every one of those virgins will be married one day. The betrothal phase was an attesting of their faith which also speaks of an attesting of our faith right now. We're in the betrothal phase. We do not know who the bride is, but we do know, however, that one of the main attributes of the bride of Christ is being a wise virgin. As it is clear that only wise virgins get to go into the place that the groom has built for his bride, which primarily is attached to the Father's house, and where the wedding feast will take place. You know, a rabbi uh, might ask his student, going back to the Midrash perspective, a rabbi might ask his student, who is the one that is wise? And a student who understands the wedding customs would answer correctly, it is the one who keeps his or her lamp filled with oil. They are the true bride. So the one who keeps their lamp trimmed and filled with oil and burning brightly is the true bride. You know, Jesus is coming back for his betrothed bride, those who hold fast to their profession of faith without wavering, those who endure to the end and are faithful. Matthew 24, 13 says, But he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. We are marrying Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who is presently building a room unto the Father's house for those who are wise and keeping their vessels filled with the Holy Spirit, keeping their bodies, their souls filled with the Holy Spirit and their lives lit in and for Him. John 14, 2 says, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. That's exactly where we are right now. The Lord is preparing a place for those who profess to know Him spiritually for those who are in one accord with Him, for those who have the Spirit of Christ living in them. I pray you and I will be named among those virgins who are called to endure the end, to be ready, filled with the Spirit when the Lord returns. And finally, Revelation 19.7 says, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to Him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come and his wife had made herself ready. Thank you so much for listening to this Love for the Truth broadcast and to the Prophesied Bride of Christ teaching series. Again, I'm Cindy Hartline. Until next time, big hugs.